My experiences of um, benchmarking, of usability benchmarking, of um, taking over a team where it was already going on, and of introducing it to um, some new teams. Um, I'm Katie Taylor, and I'm Head of Experience Design at the Wellcome Trust in London. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically we're a charitable foundation who give grants of money to scientists all over the UK and world. And we promote science and promote science education too. And all of this with the aim to improve human health. And I joined the Wellcome Trust just at the beginning of the summer, uh, where I lead the team of UX designers, UI designers, user researchers. And before joining Wellcome, I was um, lead user researcher on Gov.uk. And so the topic of my talk today, usability benchmarking, we're just going through starting that process at Wellcome. So most of my examples will be from Gov.uk. Uh, this image here, by the way, is from the Welcome Collection Image Gallery. I don't know if anybody has ever seen it. It's a fantastic collection of images that are part of the Welcome Collection, so go and have a look. Okay, so now, right, now on to usability testing. What is it? I was going to ask you to raise your hand if you're familiar with it. I can't really see anybody, but also you've been raising your hands a lot. But I don't know if you've ever done usability benchmarking. Sorry, not usability testing. Usability benchmarking. Um, or if you've ever heard of it. I just thought I'd give you a brief intro. It sounds simple, and it really is. At its most basic, it's measuring how many people are successful at a number of tasks in the product you're designing. So next year, you come back and measure it again. So you're setting a baseline for comparison in the future. And most often when people talk about it, they're talking about benchmarking user performance, so success rates, which cover all aspects of usability. But sometimes people will talk about it when they're talking about benchmarking trust or satisfaction scores with a particular thing. So have a look at this task here. This is one of the tasks used for usability benchmarking in Gov.uk. Um, it looks like a task you might use for any other usability study. Uh, there are two important things about this task for benchmarking. One is it's relatively short. We expect the person to be able to do this really in about two minutes. Um, the other is it's written in a way that in two or five years' time, you could come back and ask someone to do this task again. It doesn't include any reference to technology or to the organisation of government. It has the word state pension in there, but I, can, I think that might be around in five years' time. You could do this task on a desktop, on a mobile phone. You could do it using a virtual assistant. And it's agnostic to how we make our product. And this, the measure of user performance might look something like this. So you'll get the percentage of people who are successful and give the correct answer. You'll get the percentage of people who are incorrect and who don't answer, or who have an answer but don't give the right one. You might get a percentage of people who abandon or who time out. If you give them a time limit, they might refuse to carry on or they might not be able to finish in time. And maybe you're measuring how long they take to do it. So we're not capturing any qualitative information here. That's another way that usability benchmarking is really different from usability testing. In most usability testing, you're interested in why something happened, but a benchmark study doesn't really have to include that if you don't want to. It's really a raw measure of user performance. So I wouldn't ask anyone in a benchmark study to think aloud. I would just ask them to complete the task at hand. And I have to be especially careful of methods in usability benchmarking so that next year, when someone else might be running the test again, they can use exactly the same method to get a similar result or to get a comparable result. So why a benchmark usability? It's a good question because it might not have immediate value to your product or the feature you're designing right now. Instead, it helps you measure if the effort you're all putting into improving this service or product in different parts of an organization or company have improved usability. So the value comes from comparing over time. So you can find out, actually, are the product decisions we're making, have they actually improved usability over the, over the course of a year or six months? They help you improve product decisions by helping to prioritize. So you might find that, actually, one thing has a particularly low usability measure. And you can see, through prioritization, you can use that, the benchmark to help you to focus on that. You might be able to set goals for the future. So you might be able to set expectations on 
what actually are we going to try and achieve here? And also, it can help make the case for different teams to work together, because most often, um, benchmarking tasks cover parts of a product that cut across organizational teams. For example, a task to find out how much pension you'll get, like that task we saw before, that cuts across many teams on Gov.uk. It cuts across even service teams that are in a department. It cuts across content teams who are designing the content, people who are looking at search and browse. But usability benchmarking is great, and I think it can really help. Um, it needs commitment. So you're going to do it once now, and you're going to have to commit to doing it again in the future. It takes time. It takes resources to do properly. It's not appropriate for every situation. So if you're working on something like a promotional website or a campaign that's just relevant for now and you're just getting out of the door, then maybe usability testing is all you need to do to, to be able to really improve that usability. You're probably not interested in coming back and measuring how your work has improved usability in six months' time. But if you're working on something that's meant to exist over time, then it's good to have an objective measure of how usable your thing is, and that's where benchmarking comes in. So um, I've got a few references to blog posts that I decided to represent like this, that you can go and have a look at yourself. Um, and this one is about um, some work we did on Gov.uk to improve pensions content. And with benchmarking, we actually saw an increase from around 60% to 90, nearly 90% after we did this um, pensions work with DWP. And Ray Khan wrote this blog post. So when I joined Gov.uk, benchmarking was going. They'd done three rounds already. I didn't set it up. The person who was there before me set it up, and they'd been going, and they'd been doing it. They had defined tasks. They covered a range of areas and a range of different content types. And they also had a defined method. So they were doing this pretty standard method for usability benchmarking. They were doing remote, unmoderated sessions. Um, they had then post-task survey, which measured some satisfaction and trust. And we then added a sort of qualitative bit of usability testing with a follow-up moderated in-person sessions on the bit that we found most interesting. So there was regular benchmarking going on, but people didn't really know what to do with the results. There was some change happening, but not very much. Some user researchers had felt frustrated that nothing was changing, in fact. Even after they put a lot of effort into benchmarking and communicating the results, Product teams didn't seem to understand why each task had been chosen, and they couldn't relate it to the work, and they didn't believe that the findings were relevant. It wasn't clear which teams should be acting on which findings. And that was as a product of actually having such a large group of people working on one thing, so that task does cut across different teams. And in addition, managers and product managers weren't really using them. They weren't really looking at them, and they weren't using them to prioritise. So really, something wasn't working, and people were beginning to lose faith in the value of benchmarking. In fact, we didn't do round four. We skipped it, because no one felt, thought there was any need to do it. So I went back, um, and a bit like Georgia said earlier, I decided to do a bit of user research on my organization, user research, the user research, and I decided to ask Tara Land, who had had my job previously on Gov.uk, what, what she thought. And she said, actually, she thought there were two things they did wrong in setting up the benchmarking tasks. One, they didn't involve enough people in defining the tasks. So they'd only really involved a small number of people at the centre. And actually, it was a user research team-owned thing who defined these tasks. And second, she felt like, just with any other product or service, that they should have done an alpha. That they should have um, had a chance to test, improve, and iterate the tasks. So I'm just going to talk about that, those sort of key points in the rest of my talk today. David McRae, who worked on my team on Gov.uk, worked out using quite an unscientific method that if you were to usability test every page on Gov.uk, it might take you something like 30 years, and you'd only done one page once, so then you come back and do them again. So it gives you some of the idea of the challenge that Gov.uk in particular faces. We can't test everything. We have to focus and only benchmark the things that are most important to us. Prioritise benchmarking the tasks that actually we need to measure over the next five years. Now, Gov.uk is a really extreme example. It has a lot of pages, a lot of things you can do on it. But I'm sure you all face a similar situation. The people who, the products that you're working on, there won't be an appetite to benchmark every single task within that product. There's not enough time or energy. It costs money to usability benchmark everything a person can do. So 
we worked together as a team when we re-evaluated the benchmarking tasks. In the beginning, people said to me, well, yeah, I know that the success rate isn't that good, but really that, that task isn't what we or people do, and it's not really important to us. We don't, you know, that's not what we're focused on. So the difficult thing about focusing, prioritizing, choosing the tasks that you bench benchmark is making sure everyone understands why you've chosen the tasks and why they are actually important and representative of the tasks that they should care about. This is a picture of a Gov.uk team with actually David McRae in the middle going through some sorting exercises, looking at different tasks, I think, on the transport section. So you need some kind of way to decide what to benchmark. And on agreeing with your team and the other people who will be using the results, top tasks is one way to do that. So that's Jerry McGovern's method. I don't know if you saw his talk here last year. Um, it's a method that Jerry has created and popularized that involves using surveys of users to understand which tasks are the most important to them and then using those to benchmark. But for the situation I was in on Gov.uk, they already had a list. They'd already chosen what they thought or a group of people thought was the most important group of tasks. And we didn't want to throw away all the benchmarks. We had quite a lot of data by that point. So if possible, we wanted to keep that data and, and keep benchmarking on it. So we re-examined, reworded the problem ones, added tasks, and tried to understand where our teams thought the problems were. And actually through doing a bit of uh, working with the content teams, working with the teams who were using them, really understand what, what were they not understanding about the benchmarks, what were they not understanding about the tasks. We did a stock take and involved the whole team in the process. So this is an example of one of the tasks that came out of that. Initially in the benchmark, believe it or not, we didn't have any tasks related to tax. And the content team couldn't believe it, and they, they were a bit aghast. There's good reasons why there weren't any tax tasks. Um, tax joined Gov.uk quite late. So when we re-examined the task list, the content team pointed that out. We looked at some analytics, we looked at some data, we got together all, everything we knew about the tax tasks and chose one that everyone felt comfortable. It was a representative finding of a piece of information that was really important. And we wrote this task together. Now, benchmarking measures the whole experience of using a product. It's up to us to interpret the whole package of results and what, work out what, from those results, what you learn from benchmarking, which bits need attention, which bits are the problem spots, and how are we going to tackle them. For a site like Gov.uk, it's really a content management problem. And we found that our content team, who were the people who benefited most from benchmarking, not really the product team, which was where it sat before. But for other products, for other apps, for other things, you might find it's someone else who benefits most from the results. So um, one of the other things we decided when we were involving the whole team is actually benchmarking would be owned by the content team on Gov.uk. And the user researcher in the content team was assigned to run benchmarking, and the results were used to manage content. We looked at it a bit broader, and we decided, actually, maybe there's a case to go bigger with benchmarking. Let's not just give up where everyone is not, um, uh, doesn't understand how to use the results. But if we're going to, we should be more uh, being positive about benchmarking and showing people how to use it. And if we're going to do that, maybe we should look at how, it, how we're using benchmarking across the whole site. So we decided to use, start using usability benchmarking as a tool, really, to, to manage content. So we decided to roll out some top tasks for each of the main site, main portions of the site on gov.uk. So for example, um, education and learning and transport. We decided to use a top task approach for that because government agencies actually were quite, some of them were quite familiar with top tasks as a, an approach. And it was quite a user-centered way to approach it rather than trying to get a list of benchmarking tasks that was more business-focused or policy-centered. And when I left Gov.uk, they're still working towards getting a list of top tasks for each site, for each portion of the site. So that's kind of benchmarking as prioritization. It's prioritization in the results and how you use the results and how you use that to inform what you might be working on. But also, actually choosing the tasks is a, is a way of prioritizing too. Related to that, I'm going to talk about doing an alpha, the second thing that Tara talked about. And I think that really we should treat the first round of benchmarking always as an alpha. So that's as a prototype. 
Right at the beginning, at the first round of benchmarking on Gov.uk, the team knew that some things weren't working. Some tasks were unnecessarily long, complex. Some tasks needed to change, but people felt trapped by saying it was a benchmark. It isn't to say that you should abandon a pilot study or not test out the task beforehand. But after the first round, review your tasks and your method and make sure you're happy to keep them that way for five years. And if not, then be prepared to change. Swap out some tasks. Be prepared to delay benchmark for another three, six months or a year. Start again in round two. And the question to ask is, do, is the data we have good enough? Is the method robust enough that we'll be able to plot a reliable trend data? Or should we rewrite the task and reset the benchmark? We uh, reviewed after round four some of the tasks, and we also reviewed after round seven. In the past, we'd asked people to complete the benchmarking on a desktop, starting from gov.uk, from the homepage. And as you can imagine, it's not really an entirely accurate description of how people use gov.uk. They mostly arrive from Google, and almost half the time, they're using a mobile or tablet. So for that round of benchmarking, we actually started one sample of users on Google and one on gov.uk. And then we also, for the um, moderated usability sessions, we started people on a mobile phone. So we're trying to iterate the benchmarking as we go forward to reflect actually how we use the results and how gov.uk is used. So now you've heard a bit about gov.uk, the challenges, how we have used benchmarking, how it is used to track performance. Um, and some examples to try. I'm going to, some examples of the things that I've tried. Um, I'm going to give you some tips on how to start now doing benchmarking. So first of all, figure out why you want to do it and who will look at the measures. It's incredibly useful, but benchmarking actually takes a lot of time and it's investment. So you need to make sure that you're willing to put in that time and that you'll get from what you need out of it. Um, you need to choose some tasks to benchmark. I've talked quite a bit about that already. Use top tasks as a method or use another prioritization method that you're using in your teams to decide what those tasks are. You need to decide what you're going to measure. You probably need a, a success measure, some kind of measure of user performance, but do you, want, do you worry about time on task? Do you need to know about trust or satisfaction or other survey questions that you can include in your benchmarking? And do you need to set goals? Should you be using these to set goals for your product, for your quarterly planning, or for any other kind of uh, product planning? Usability benchmarking is not like usability testing. So remember that to get repeatable results, you need to run sessions in a repeatable way. So think about prototyping, running sessions, and how you're going to generate robust data. And also think about reporting and ownership. Who will use the data and what decisions will they be making with it? Will it be a product manager who's going to use it to prioritize or will it be a developer who's going to use it to understand how their work impacts? And what's going to, do, what's going to happen if the results of the benchmarking aren't as good as you want them to be? At Welcome, where I currently work, we are just starting to run usability benchmarking on two products. So the first, actually, is an internal tool, our intranet, called Trustnet. It's a fantastic product. Um, not only are the product team involved, but we're involving internal comms, and it's a very small team. So I think the kickoff workshop was about six people, and that's the whole, that's everybody who works in there, from all sides. Um, we're using a top tasks approach, and Dana Chan, who works on my team, is in the audience, um, has been leading the conversations that we're having which have been really interesting and useful. And just by making that list of tasks people are doing on our internet has opened our eyes to the variety, wide variety of things. And we've had conversations like whether the internet is a hub or whether there are other tools, a hub to access other tools, or whether there are other tools that actually aren't part of the internet and how we think about the product in a different way. This is part of the list of the top tasks that we've come up with. Um, and the survey is actually out right now. If you work at um, the Wellcome Trust, go and take it. Uh, we started out with all the raw data, collected it all, and did lots of workshops to come up with this list. So we're really looking forward to the results. 
The second, we're also benchmarking on the second product is the Welcome Collection website. And Hayley Thayer, who's also in the audience, did this work. Um, so we've started by trying to choose the tasks we're going to benchmark. Um, and we also use it as a way to bring the team together. So you probably can't read what's on the labels there. Probably they're cut off a little bit. The, first, the top five from the top are what's currently on, search the collection, detailed information about an exhibition, read an article or story, and event calendar. The surprising thing that didn't make it into the top five was opening times. The whole team thought that that would make it into top five. It's in the top 10, it's number seven. Um, so we're still at the prioritizing stage. We're still trying to understand which tasks we should be benchmarking. And then at the beginning of next year, we can start get going on benchmarking. Um, this is another great picture from the Welcome Collection image library of a tree that you can see, a kind of strange tree. Um, I've talked about benchmarking taking time and being an investment. And the ancient Greek proverb that goes, a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they know they shall never sit. And I feel that kind of sums up benchmarking. That even if you're doing it now and you think, oh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to use these results myself, it doesn't relate to my product. Next year, someone's going to come back. It might be you, it might be someone else who's working in your company or on your team. And they can understand, has, has the work your team has done in the last year actually improved the usability of this product and the success rates? And by starting now, you can create a measure that will be used well into the future. So here's that list again, how to get started. I've also included in the slides some um, links to articles on how to write um, usability benchmarking tasks, because you could do a whole talk on just that. Um, and finally, just good luck with your benchmarking. <laughs>